Fogland. Episode 1. Crow Square. By Mark Capel. I sat in a chair. A rocking chair. Staring out through the first floor window. Guitar resting on my knee. I was staring, but not with any purpose. My eyes saw nothing. They were looking inwards, searching for that indefinable thing called inspiration. There was no way to write a song. Not that I knew how to write a song. In fact, I'd avoided writing songs my whole life. I'd been quite content to play other people's songs. A busker earns his money by catching the mood of the times. In spring, you play songs that are jaunty as fresh as daffodils, songs that make people feel good to be alive. In winter, you try and warm up the passers-by, play songs that make them want to stomp their feet. Love songs work the whole year round. The more sentimental they are, the better. People are never far away from their memories of love found, love lost, or the hope of love to come. The guitar has always felt like an extension of myself. When it's not nestling under my armpit, or dangling from a strap, it feels like I'm missing a limb. Yes, we're definitely in a relationship, me and my guitar. And yet, unlike most guitar players, I'd never had the urge to try and write my own song. Until now. Now was the time. But what to write about? I wrenched myself away from my daydreaming, and looked at what I could see out of my window. I should just write a song about what I see, I thought. Keep it simple. It was a foggy night. That was nothing new. It's foggy in this town about 200 days of every year. Something about air flows, air currents, jet streams. I'm no weather expert, but the fog is so much a feature of our town that people have stopped calling it by its real name and started calling it Fogland. I didn't want to write a song about the fog. How obvious would that be? So what else did I see out of my window? I live in a square. Crow Square. There are houses facing me, though I hardly see them because of the fog. In the middle of the square is a garden, with ash trees and a pond. It has iron railings surrounding it. The gate to the garden is locked. Only people who live in the square have keys to it, but it's overgrown and wild. I'm not sure when I last spent time sitting in it. Looking out the window, there was one curious thing that I noticed. A man, wearing a bowler hat, was walking round the square. A man wearing a bowler hat is strange enough in this day and age, usually only seen on the head of exhibitionists working in the financial district. But even they usually restrict themselves to wearing it on their way to work and back, not in the evening. A bowler hat is more for fancy dress these days, not for a stroll in the streets. And this man in his bowler hat was just walking round and round the square. I'd seen him complete at least four circuits. It's not a big square, and a complete circuit at normal walking pace takes only about four or five minutes. Surely there were better ways to get exercise. I watched him turn left disappearing into the fog on the far side of the square, and wondered if he'd be coming round again. When the stranger disappeared, I started strumming my guitar, absent-mindedly travelling from one chord to another, sliding up and down the fretboard without thinking too hard about where I was going. After barely thirty seconds of doing this, I heard a knocking. It was coming from the other side of the wall the wall that's adjoining the house next door. It was a rapid tap-tap-tap sound, but not all that loud, and it soon stopped. I carried on playing, but the knocking returned. This time, the knocks were harder, more of the complaining variety. When I stopped strumming, the knocking stopped. This was odd, because I'd spent many hours playing the guitar in my one-bedroom apartment. A musician has to rehearse, even a humble busker. But there had been no knocking before. I thought about retaliating, 
walking up to the wall and hammering it with my knuckles. But I didn't. I just stopped playing and stood the guitar up against the wall. I didn't really have any ideas for my first song anyway. I didn't even have a chord progression that would spark a melody. I'd just been meandering through a succession of vaguely logical steps. Inspiration had decided to stay away. I stared out the window again. There was a bowler-hatted man, emerging from the frog, hands in the pockets of his long winter coat, the collar now turned up as protection against what was turning into a chilly night. I closed the curtains and went to bed. The next morning was bright and warm, warm enough that I decided to venture out without my coat. I slung my guitar case over my shoulder and headed towards the tunnel, my usual busking pitch. It's a cheap trick that buskers use. Most people sound good playing and singing in a tunnel. The reverberation hides any bum guitar notes and off-key singing in its harmonics. It's like singing in the bath, but better and your fingers don't get wrinkled. I placed my guitar case on the ground, trying to ignore the vague smell of piss in the tunnel, and, as usual, I sprinkled some coins in the case. An old busker told me this trick. He said that people are more likely to give if they can see that other people have already given. Strange but true. I put the strap over my shoulder and set about tuning the guitar. When it was in tune, I went through one of my set lists, the set list I call Spring Tuesday. I imagined I was playing in a stadium with thousands of screaming fans, instead of the one man and his dog who were actually standing in front of me. That man stood listening to me for a good ten minutes, but did he leave a single coin? Nope. Anyway, three quarters of the way through my first set of songs, mid-morning, I suddenly had an idea for a melody. An original melody. My own song. As boredom was setting in, and there were no spectators walking through the tunnel, I decided to try it out. The result was surprisingly good. I had no words to go with the tune. I tried to marry some with it, but they didn't sound right. They were either too obvious, had been heard in a thousand songs before, or didn't match the melody. So I hummed and added a few la-la-las. I have a line for you. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I'd been so wrapped up in my music that I hadn't seen the woman approach from the other side. She was a few years younger than me, probably about 19, and wore a military-style coat. I stopped playing. You do? You're writing a song, yeah? Yeah. I thought so. You had that otherworldly look on your face. I've got a friend who writes her own songs. She has that look sometimes. The tune just came to me. I was trying to get it right. Sounds good. I like it. A bit sad, but it's got a good rhythm. I nodded. I couldn't help but agree with her assessment about it being sad. So what's the line? I asked. It's okay if you don't like it. It's nothing special. But I thought that it would be cool if the words you used were about things that happened to you. It was similar to my way of thinking the previous night, staring out the window. She carried on. Every love song that ever needed writing has been written. Who needs more of those? You should write about your day. Who you talk to. What happens to you? That kind of thing. It would be very much my own song, I thought. So why not gather lines during the day? I think that would be tray fresh. I didn't know if it would be tray fresh, but it would be a bit different. Yeah, why not? What's your line? I asked. My line is this, she said. There was a pause. Then she laid it out very slowly. When a stranger passing by gives you a line. That's the line? That's the line. I thought about it. I didn't like it much. 
but it was reflective of my day. OK, that's the first line of the song. She nodded, then just walked away, and I carried on busking. Whenever the tunnel emptied, even if it was only for a couple of minutes, I would plug away at my song. I would sing the first line, the line donated to me, in the hope that an idea for the second line of lyrics would attach itself. But it never did. Although I had the tune pretty much down, the words remained elusive. Apart from that one line, when a stranger passing by gives you a line. The line had sounded odd when the girl had given it to me, but the more I sang it, the more it seemed to fit the song. I can't really explain it. It just felt right. Something inside me screamed out that, yes, this was the line, and that this had always been the first line to my song, that it was just waiting to be found, like a stray puppy. I'd heard songwriters talk about songs as if they were people. Songs they had just written were newborns, and songs they had written years ago were old friends. I'd scoffed at the idea, but now I was involved in the process, I could actually understand what they were talking about. This song had its own personality, and I was in the midst of discovering it. It was getting dark. I walked home watching the sun dip beneath the skyline. I don't know if the fog does actually thicken at night, or just appears to. It had been barely noticeable today, but now rolled along like somebody laying out a rug, a rug without end. When I reached Crow Square, the fog was about the same density it had been the night before. As I followed the iron railings lining the garden, I was surprised to see the bowler-hatted man walking round the square again. I should walk past him and not say a thing, I told myself. But I had to ask him the question, the question that was burning in my brain. I couldn't stop myself. Excuse me, I said. He seemed quite surprised by my presence, as if he hadn't noticed me before. I'm sorry to stop you. He pulled up the collar of his winter coat. But I noticed you walking round the square last night. Yes. He had a brusque tone in his voice. Why? Why what? Why do you walk around the square? He scowled at me. I waited for an answer, but he didn't give me one. The scowl went on and on. Sorry, I said, eventually, and walked by as quickly as I could. I heard his voice from behind. You're a busker, he said. The word busker had the force of an accusation. I stopped and turned around. Yes, I am. I saw you in the tunnel. I didn't remember him. But perhaps he was wearing different clothes. Odd that he would wear a bowler hat in the evening instead of during the daytime. But hey, whatever. It takes all sorts. You were humming a tune. As if you didn't know the words. Oh, that tune doesn't have any words. It's a song I'm writing. He nodded. Then he looked down at my shoes. I waited for him to look up at me again, but he kept staring at my feet. I could hear his breathing. It was unnerving. Then he spoke slowly, with a voice that sounded different from the one he'd used in our conversation so far. It was sharper. And the bowler-hatted man suggests a shoe shine, he said. Then he looked up. His eyes were dark, darker than I remembered. Maybe the hat was shielding them from the light. But no, it wasn't a shadow. He suddenly looked like he'd gone without sleep for a week. He hadn't looked like that before, I was certain. He was like a different person. Sorry, I said. I've got a dash. I turned round and immediately broke into a jog. I tried to make it look as casual as possible, but the stranger's weird transformation had shaken me. As I ran, I reached into the back pocket of my jeans for my keys. I didn't dare look behind me until I had the keys in the lock of the door. 
as I frantically turned the key in the lock, I risked glancing over my shoulder. The man wasn't there. I wondered if he'd carried on walking, doing another circuit of the square, but I was in no mood to wait and find out. I rushed into the building, ran up the stairs and quickly speared another key into the lock of my own front door. Inside the apartment, I slammed the door behind me. No sooner had I shut the door, to what I hoped was peace and quiet, than I heard the knocking. This time, the knocking was harder and angrier, as if the person doing it was no longer using his knuckles, but had upgraded to a broomstick handle. I walked slowly down the hallway to the lounge, laying my guitar down in a corner as quietly as I could. I didn't dare turn on any lights. I didn't want the bowler-hatted man to see me from outside. Those eyes! How had they changed? Luckily, there was just enough light spilling from the street lamp to lift the Stygian gloom, helping me not to fall over the furniture. The knocking stopped. I waited. The knocking didn't start up again. I edged my way towards the window, careful about looking out, not wanting to be seen from the street below. I nudged my cheek up against the cold metal window frame, which numbed it. I could just about see the square, or at least the part of it not shrouded by fog. There was still no sign of the bowler-hatted man. I stayed in this position for a good five or ten minutes, at no point did the bowler-hatted man emerge from the fog. On my walk home, I'd begun to feel hungry. But I'd lost that hunger. I didn't want to eat anything. I walked into the kitchen and poured myself a glass of fizzy water in the dark. Drinking a glass of water was an ordinary act that brought me to my senses, calmed my anxiety. I turned on the kitchen light then I strode into the lounge and turned on a couple of the wall lights. I didn't even bother to shut the curtains. That was better. I took my guitar out of its case and began to work on my song. Playing the guitar was what relaxed me. The bowler-hatted man was eccentric. Very odd. But this town was full of eccentrics. I liked the melody of my song. The introductory instrumental set it up nicely. I sang the first line. When a stranger passing by gives you a line. I should have stopped there. But it was as if somebody else was playing the guitar. My fingers moved independently of my mind. They went on to the second line. My mouth seemed liberated by the fingers' rush to independence. It wanted the same freedom. It kept on singing. And the bowler had it, man. Suggests a shoe shine. It scanned perfectly. It didn't make sense logically, but musically, the sound of each syllable, of each and every word, sat on that line like a row of nightingales singing to the dawn. Again, I tried to stop the song. My lips met and should have stayed in contact with each other, but they insisted on parting. I attempted to force my tongue down onto the floor of my mouth, but it wouldn't rest. It wanted to sing. It went hurtling towards the next line. If I stopped strumming my guitar, perhaps my mouth would close again, I told myself. My tongue would rest, deterred by my self-control. But neither my mouth nor my tongue was having any of it. My fingers picked aside, and it wasn't mine. They colluded with my mouth and tongue. They slid up towards the next chord on the fretboard. And then the knocking began again. The insistent knocking. It was harder than ever. The walls vibrating. Knocking and knocking and knocking. I'd never met my neighbour, but I hadn't had any trouble from him either. My body's rebellion continued. My mouth... My tongue, my fingers paid no attention to my mind. They carried on with the song. Suddenly, I knew what the next line was. I have no idea where it came from, but it was as if my mind had jumped ship. It had decided that I was on the losing side, 
that my mouth, my tongue, my fingers were part of the winning coalition. I sang the next line. And when the dead man comes knocking. I sang it with such a malevolence that it didn't seem to be like my voice at all. It was a horrible line, but it sat on the musical notes as if it belonged, as if it had always belonged. The song had to be stopped. I stood up from the chair, grabbed the neck of my guitar, and slammed the soundbox against the wall as hard as I could, shattering it. The wood fractured, splinters flew off in all directions. I struck it against the wall again and again, until there was nothing left in my hand but the neck. Then I hurled that against the wall and burst into tears. Bitter tears, tears that fell onto the floor. But at least the song had stopped. There was no music in my head, no music in the room. And the knocking, the dreaded knocking, that had stopped too. I slumped down into the chair, pinching my eyelids, stemming the tears. I don't know how long I sat there, how long it took me to stabilise my breathing, to steady my heart rate. I'm guessing it was about 15 minutes before I felt calm. Eventually, my fingers, my lips, my tongue felt normal, a normal part of me. But I remained in the chair. I wasn't hungry or thirsty. And clearing up the mess, the firewood that was once my guitar could wait until morning. What would I do? I asked myself. I couldn't go busking tomorrow. I'd have to buy another guitar. I wasn't even sure I had enough money for a good one. It must have been another half an hour before I stood up. When I did, I felt my legs wobble. I trudged into the kitchen and put the kettle on to boil. I wasn't particularly hungry, but I thought I should eat. A couple of slices of toast would see me through until bedtime, so I placed two slices of bread in the toaster. I waited for the kettle to boil and the toaster to pop, staring at the cupboards, the nondescript kitchen cupboards, staring at them, but not really looking. I started to hear music. At first, it was distant and barely audible. It sounded a long way off. I walked out of the kitchen, even though the kettle had just boiled. And as I walked along the hallway, the music got louder. When I reached the lounge, the music sounded like it was on top of me, as if a band was playing by the fireplace. But there was no band. I recognised the tune. It was my song. The song I'd written. The introduction was being played over and over. But then there was a pause. A lengthy pause. Was that it? Was it over? No. A voice sang the first line. It wasn't my voice. My lips were still. It was a voice I thought I recognised, though I couldn't put a name to it. It echoed as if the vocalist was in a cathedral. The sound bounced off the walls, walls that had to be made of old stone to produce that kind of reverberation. The voice sang the first line. When a stranger passing by gives you a line. The voice sang the second line. And the bowler-hatted man suggests a shoeshine. I spun round and stared out the window. The bowler-hatted man had reappeared, walking from out of the fog. But this time he didn't follow the iron railings around the garden. He changed direction and walked towards my apartment. The voice sang the third line. And when the dead man comes knocking. On cue. And on the beat, the knocking on the wall recommenced, louder than ever. It wasn't a broomstick this time, it was a mallet. It echoed too. The voice had to stop singing now. There were no more lines in the song. Or so I thought. 
but there was one more line. The voice sang the final line. The end is near. Can you hear the clock tick-tocking? That was the last line. The music disappeared. I stared at the door and waited. You have been listening to Fogland, episode one, Crow Square by Mark Capel. Music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. To find out more about Fogland and to discover books written by exciting authors, visit www.fogland.net. This recording copyright the Fogland Project 2014.